I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. So today I'm going to do something a little different. You know, in a lot of the book reviews, my book, The Forgetting Moon, my series, The Five Warrior Angels, and a lot of the book reviews you find on audible.com, amazon.com, Goodreads, I get compared to John Gwynn's the Faithful and the Fallen series more than any other book series out there. I mean, I get compared to George R.R. R. Martin a lot, Robert Jordan, Tad Williams certainly a lot. You know, Barnes & Noble's coined this as a hard-hitting heavy metal fantasy. I get compared to a lot of the old heavy metal fantasies from the 80s, 70s, and 80s, you know, like Elric and Conan, um, Thieves' World, all that stuff. But the guy I get compared to the most is this John Gwynn. Malice, Valor, Ruin, and Wrath, his four book series of the faithful and the fallen. I get compared to that all the time. And so I'm thinking, who is this John Gwynn guy that thinks he can write books similar to mine? Who is this guy? And what's his deal? I thought, well, why don't I give it a shot? Why don't I read them and see? Why don't I read these and see why people compare me to him so much, if the comparisons are valid, if there are differences and similarities in the books, and I will talk to you as a writer about another person's writing and my writing and how they differ and how you can do things differently in your writing and still be successful no matter how you do it, and how, no matter what you write, especially if it's in the fantasy genre, you are going to be doing things that are strangely cryptically similar to someone else, even though you've never read that person. Because the influences in the fantasy genre are vast and huge. And I can tell by reading John Gwynn that we are pulling from a lot of the same influences. So the criticisms and the reviews that people write and compare me to John Gwynn and John Gwynn to me are valid after having read the first two books. What I'm going to do is I'm going to review Malice and Valor in this review, because those are the only two that I've read so far. And then later I will review books three and four. Um, you can do the math on that. That'll be two reviews total. At least I think that's two reviews. I, I, I'm not good at math. But anyway, let's talk about the books. John Gwynn's Faithful and the Fallen series. And the comparisons that people draw between the two of us as writers. Let's talk about the compare. Let's talk about the things that are comparable first, and then I'll get into the differences at the end. So the comparable things are. Man, John Gwynn starts his books right off the bat in a small medieval village, which I do too. I do the same thing. But before that, we do a little prologue where we set up sort of uh, the good versus evil that's going on in the land, in the landscape. There is a little bit of a prologue where we, where we find out that there's a conflict, and then we jump right into the small medieval village and the small medieval village life. Now, John Gwynn spends, and this is kind of to, not too spoilery, but John Gwynn, and this is one of the things that I wanted to do with my novel, was I wanted to spend quite a bit of time with my characters in the small medieval village before they went off on their adventure into the rest of the fantasy land. And before they went off on their quests and they got involved in all the wars, I wanted to get to know these characters really well for a good portion of book number one of mine, which is The Forgetting Moon. And I do that for about half the book we spend with these characters getting to know them in their village before the bad guys come and sack the village. Okay? John Gwynn does the same thing. We get to know this village of Dunkareg. And I love the, and that's another thing that is similar to uh, to what me and John Gwynn are doing is is that our name, the way we name our villages, our towns, and our characters, uh, we have a very similar naming system. So it sounds like 
He's got Dunkareg, which, you know, that feels like it could be a Welch, an actual Welch village. And I've got different things like that in my book where I pulled them. I mean, I gathered, I got maps of England and Wales and, and Scotland and Norway and Finland and Germany. And I pulled different names of different villages that actually existed in our real world and put them in my book and on my map that's in my book and just morphed the names a little bit so they sounded grounded in reality. And I think John Gwynn does the same thing here and he does it good, better than most fantasy authors where it sounds like everything he's got in his world building is grounded in some sort of reality just by the naming conventions alone of his characters and his villages and the different realms and kingdoms that he's got. They, they feel like they belong in the world. And I can't say that about a lot of modern day fantasy writers. It just feels like they're pulling syllables and words just out of out of thin air and just kind of combining them. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. That was one of the criticisms I had of uh, one of my favorite fantasy series, which is the Stormlight Archives. I, 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 if you watched my review of the Way of Kings and the Words of Radiance, you'll see that I take exception to some of the naming conventions that Brandon Sanderson uses. We won't get into that. Um, let's talk about malice and valor. So yeah, the villages and the naming conventions, all the characters are named and all the villages are named very, very well. And I made it a point to make sure that I did the same, same, took the same sort of theories behind my naming conventions. So that is a similarity. So we've got the village. We start off in a, in, in a village and we stay in the village and we get to know the characters as they work in and out of their village. And the village is not this grandiose fantasy place. It's like a real small contained medieval type village with a little keep or a castle and, 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 and a baron and a ruler up in it. And, and that's kind of the way I did. So I when, when people start reading Malice and they start reading Forgetting Moon, they're getting a lot of the same similar things right off the bat. So I can see why people make the comparison just based off of that. Now, my villagers leave and get kicked out of the village about halfway through my novel. John Gwynn keeps his villagers in that village the entire novel, which I would have loved to have done here, but due to time constraints and book contracts, I kind of had to shorten it up a little bit. But let's talk about just the village itself and the surrounding areas. You know, we've got all these characters, namely Corbin, who's our main guy, who's our main protagonist, it seems like and his sister Cywin, who are two of my favorite characters, and they've kind of got their nemesis Rafe, who's sort of the bully, and this is another thing that I have that is shockingly similar to my books, is I have got young kids as my protagonists in the village, and a, and a bully, and you know, the different dynamics that happen in a medieval village when you've got guys that are training to be warriors and, and some of them are better skilled, more skilled than the others and they become bullies and this, that, and the other. You know, Rafe and Corbin, I've got similar characters in Nail and Janko who, they clash. They clash all the time in this village. I get another similarity. I mean, I, the similarities are piling up and piling up as I'm reading through Malice just at the beginning, just in the first few chapters. I'm like... <laughs> Yeah, we're going down the same path, it seems. We're going down the same path. And it's delightful to read. It's delightful for me to read um, someone else from another part of the world who, we, who the two of us have never met, the two of us have never read each other's stuff, and to see the similarities of what we've created. Not only that, as a shout out, I usually wear my Raiders hat for all my videos. I decided to take it off and go bald-headed because out of respect for John Gwynn, because in his author photo, he's bald-headed with a goatee. The similarities, like I said, they're, they're just... What can you say? What can you say? You know, good versus evil. The story is set up with a prophecy. My story is set up with a prophecy. The story is set up with a prophecy about all these magical weapons that are hidden throughout the realm. My story is set up with all these uh, prophecies about magical weapons hidden throughout the realm. And a prophecy that the uh, bad guys are going to come and start a war 
sort of like an Armageddon, <laughs> and they're going to be using these weapons, and the good guys need to get the weapons before the bad guys need to get the weapons. Yeah, it's all, it's all, I mean, boom, boom, both of us. It's uncanny, but not really that uncanny, because how many other fantasy novels out there have the same, I mean, it, it, it you know, the Belgariad, the Sword of Shannara, yeah, everything, everything out there, every, all of it, all of it, everything that he read as a kid and I read as a kid, we've taken all this stuff and we put it into our stories. My series is called The Five Warrior Angels. His series is called The Faithful and the Fallen. What's strange is he's actually got warrior angels in his series. My series is called The Five Warrior Angels. Again, another strange kawinky dink that just, you know. So when people, now it's starting to make sense, all these reviews on Goodreads and Audible and Amazon that say, hey, this series reminds me a lot of The Faithful and the Fallen by John Gwynn and vice versa. People read his books and say, hey, that reminded me a lot of Durfee's uh, Five Warrior Angels. Another thing we do is we've got... Um, you know, I talked about the characters. You know, there's great characters in this. One of the things about book one, of the at least the American version, there's no character list. So I kept having to pick up book two because there's a character list in these other. And there's a lot of characters. I have a lot of characters. He has a lot of characters. Probably about a similar amount. And there's character lists in my book. There's character lists in his book four, three, and two. But there's no character list in book number one. And I'm like, what the... I had to go. I had to keep referring to book number two to keep everyone straight. But once everyone's straight, then you're on the, on the path and you're doing well. So just keep in mind if you are reading book number one and you can't keep the characters straight, just go buy book number two and look at that. Uh, because you'll need it. You'll need it. You'll really need it because uh, you want to keep the characters straight, who they're aligned with, who what realm they're from. Because there's a lot. It's like Game of Thrones. It's like my book. Where, yeah, we do start out in the, the, the medieval village, but we also, we branch off into other characters, you know, in the big cities or out in the forests or the outlaws in the forests, different things like that. And he's got, he's got, all, John Gwynn has all that, like I do, the outlaws that hang out in the forest, the bad guys in the forest, the, uh, the people in the bigger cities, the kings and the queens and all their political machinations. Um, we get all that. At a, at a low level. I mean, it's not anything grandiose. I, I keep my political stuff kind of on the down low. And John Gwynn really keeps his political stuff on the down low. Yeah, there's political things going on, but it's not the intricate, just plot-heavy stuff that you'll find in Game of Thrones or some of those other books. Um, again, more similarities between the two of us. And, you know, some of the other characters he's got are... I already mentioned Corbin and his sister... Cywin and Rafe, the villagers, there's a whole lot of other villagers there. You know, there's a witch and the king and the queen and, and, uh, this is really cool. And, and, and the witch has a bird and, uh, we'll get to the animals in a second. Um, but some of the other characters out in other parts of the story are, uh, Nathir and Veratis and Kestel and JL, um, all of them great. There's giants. Uh, another similarity is, Malice, in John Gwynn stuff, he's got the giants that used to live in the realm until the humans sort of sort of colonialized the realm and kicked the giants off and put them sort of on giant reservation. You know, sort of like, you know, the English colonials came over and put the, the American Indians out on the reservation. That's kind of the similar thing. I've got a similar idea in my books with creatures called the ogles and even the dwarfs and the elves in my book they lived in the five isles until the colonists came to the five isles and sort of banished all the elves and the dwarves and the ogles to remote parts of the islands and uh, then took over the islands right the similarities like i say when people read this i get it why there's there's a lot of similarities between us um Let's talk about the animals. That's another similarity. I like having animals in my book. Um, you know, I've got several horses, ponies, dogs that becomes kind of characters in the books. And so does John Gwynn. He's got woven. He's got uh, dogs. He's got horses. He's got birds. 
Now, what I hate most of all in fantasy is when the animals start to talk. Like they can commute. I don't like the whole, uh, and there's a lot of fantasy series I read that do this that I think are great fantasy series. So I don't think I'm bagging on any of those. But I don't like the telecommunication with animals. I don't like it when the animals actually speak, like in the Chronicles of Narnia, when the lion is talking. I hate that. I don't know why. It's just one of my pet peeves. Thank goodness none of the animals in my books talk. None of the animals in The Faithful and the Fallen talk. But they are strong characters just by being the animals themselves. Actually, I'm wrong. One of the birds <laughs> does talk in The Faithful and the Fallen. But no, no more, no more so than a, a parrot mimics the speech of uh, us in real life. I mean, it's just one of those kind of birds that just sort of squawks things that people say. Um, so it's talk. It talks, you know. Uh, in fact, the only foul language in the faith of the unfallen is that bird. I'm so proud of that pun. <laughs> Came to me in the spot. <laughs> the only foul, you know, there's, <clears throat> I'm rated R. This is, now let's talk about some of the differences. Speaking of foul language. I'm rated R. My books are rated R. They are George R. R. Martin, Braveheart, Gladiator, Blood and Guts. Foul language books. The difference between me and, and uh, Faithful and the Fallen is John Gwynn, rated PG, rated PG. There's no right or wrong. None of, neither one of us is doing it better or worse. He went down the PG-13 road. I went down the rated R road. You know, I got foul language. He's also got foul language. But it's just from the bird. <laughs> I amuse myself, folks. I amuse myself with this. <clears throat> so let's talk more about some of the differences. We've talked about a lot of the similarities, which are numerous. Let's talk about some of the differences. Some of the differences, just speaking as a writer now, I made it, if you've watched any of my creative writing tip videos, you will know that I speak a lot about how I took Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones, The Dragon Bone Chair, Lonesome Dove, uh, Shogun, Pillars of the Earth. I took all these books that I loved and I studied how these writers were constructing their stories, namely how these writers were, if a, if, a, if a character walks on scene, how many words does that writer use to describe that character? And I came up with a formula that I stuck to throughout my novels where no matter if the character was a, who, what, whatever the character was, whether it was a major character or a minor character, whenever they stepped onto scene, they got a description of some sort, what they were wearing, what color of hair they were, fat, thin, bald, tall, short, stumpy, dwarf, elf, whatever. They got some sort of character description. One of the things that I found that was vastly different between me and John Gwynn is he does not do that. He mentions the character's name and by God, that's about it. You kind of have to construct what the character looks like in your own mind, which to me is bothersome. To a lot of people, it's not. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. Both are right. It's just a stylistic choice that authors make. Once in a while, John Gwynn will mention that Rafe has blonde hair or this guy's got a scar or stuff like that, but it comes sort of in randomly, it sort of randomly hits you after you've already sort of gotten to know the character and picture them in your mind at yourself. That is one of the things that we do different. I am a lot more wordy than John Gwynn. I do a lot more exposition scenes. I do a lot more descriptive scenes. Uh, he does some great descriptions, but it's minimalistic. Uh, you know, he describes the castle in a few sentences. You get the idea. A castle in my book, I'm taking a couple of paragraphs to describe that thing. The outlaws are walking through a forest in his book. He might give half a paragraph of description of the forest and the trees. Outlaws walk through a forest in my book. Man, you're going to get a couple paragraphs. My book is, is quite honestly a lot more wordy than John Gwynn's. And it reflects that in some of the reviews that we get on Audible and uh, Goodreads and Amazon and the other review sites is 
Some of the criticism that I take is that I am a little too wordy. Um, I did that on purpose because I love reading wordy books like Wheel of Time, Game of Thrones, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn by Tad Williams, Malazan Book of the Fallen. I love the wordy purple prose and I put it in there. I like to paint a very vivid picture. John Gwynn is a little more minimalistic on that. He still paints a picture, but with fewer words. Like I said, there's no right or wrong to it. So that, as a writer, just as I was reading through these two first two books, I was sort of had my editing hat on, <laughs> which writers do when we read other writers. We, we sort of are like, oh, I would have done this different. I would have done that different. Not that we're like trying to correct the book or saying that we're better, but it's just how our brains sort of spin through these tales. We're like, oh, man, this guy's doing it perfect. This guy's doing so much better than me. Oh, but this paragraph, I wish I could have done this with it and that with it. That's kind of what I'm talking about. There is no right way or wrong way or right way or wrong way to do these things. That is one of the main differences that I noticed. And it's just sort of the wordiness. I think the world building is done a little bit differently too. And that is basically based off of the wordiness of the two of us. I tend to be more wordy, so I think the world building in my book is a lot more detailed than in The Faithful and the Fallen. However, don't let that scare you away from the world building in The Faithful and the Fallen because you still, John Gwynn still lets you know what's happening. You still are invested in the world and the story and you still get it. You still understand what you're doing and what you're dealing with. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I kind of wish I could be less wordy and get my point across like John Gwynn does. And, you know, there's a lot of readers that probably feel the same way. So that is my review of, you know, like I didn't, I didn't get into a lot of the plot stuff. I mean, like I said, all of my reviews are spoiler free. I just kind of gave you a, this is a little bit of a different type of a book review that I normally do. This is more of a writing advice slash book review slash book comparison, specifically between two series that are out there now that are on the bookshelves that people are reading a lot. And from an author's perspective, um, I really, really, really started getting into malice about halfway through. And then I was glued to book number two. It was hitting all the right notes for me. And uh, of course, why wouldn't it? <laughs> because it's so similar to my stuff. I mean, if I've written an awesome book and someone else has written books that compare to mine, of course I'm going to love them. What? what did you think? I was going to hate it? Oh, Durfee, this guy, he writes books like yours. I read it through it. Ah, this fucking sucks. Hey, it's bullshit. No, no, I thought this was freaking awesome, right? These were great. They were hitting all the right notes. I loved it. I mean, we got guys, we got horses, castles, dungeons, people crawling through dungeons, giants, big snakes killing people. We got, I mean, it's just great. It's great medieval fantasy it's great i liked i liked malice i was really into this one i can't wait to get to the other two so i'm gonna give uh malice a 7.5 let's give valor an 8.5 and let's see if the other two raise the bar all right i love the series i thought they were great and i hope you enjoyed me comparing the two so if you want to get if you've read my books, if you've read my books, you want to get something similar, I suggest, I really do recommend John Gwynn. If you've read John Gwynn and you want to get something similar, by God, I recommend my books, The Five Warrior Angels, starting with The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, book number two, The Lonesome Crown, book number three. Hey, thanks for watching this, and I hope you all go out and buy both of our series.